together. Just a quick overview of what, what we want to do here um, in the sample materials that we shared uh, yesterday. Um, there is an agenda in there and uh, it's a little bit more detailed there, but this is just sort of the highlights here. We will um, kind of kick it off with Ashley um, just kind of sharing a little bit from her experience, uh, some assignments that she's developed and student projects and some of the pedagogical benefits of, of mapping, teaching with mapping and incorporating maps into, uh, into one's pedagogy. Um, then we'll, we'll kind of turn a little bit towards uh, the data side of things, talking about just collecting and thinking about and organizing data for the purpose of creating maps and story maps. And then we'll actually make, make some maps uh, and some story maps together. And if we have time, uh, hopefully you know, these workshops are you, uh, crammed a lot into a couple hours here and we will try to take a break uh, in the middle. Uh, but if we have time, we will have a little a bit of time for wrap up reflection, any you know, question and answer. And then following the workshop, we will be uh, asking for your feedback uh, in a brief form. And um, I know it's a little bit of an extra effort to give feedback always, but we really do appreciate it. It, it helps to helps us learn about what we're, you know, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. Uh, this is the first um, ArcGIS uh, online workshop that we've done for the Ohio Five. Some of you have been to our Scalar and Omeka workshops. Uh, which have been refined over time. And so we hope to learn uh, from this as well to, to make it better in the future. Um, I do wanna just thank all of you for taking time out of your Saturday morning to be here. Um, and we already went over the agenda, so I don't have to go over that slide. So I do have time to say, if you hear um, screaming, that sounds like the word no. If you hear um, heavy footsteps and running, I have a cat who is, either on an 11 out of 10 or he is on me, you will probably see him at some point during this workshop. <laughs> um, I promise there's no cause for alarm. He's just a really vocal guy. All right, so we already went over the agenda, so let's get to it. Um, as a geography professor, I'm one of those people that um, a lot of the students don't really know what I do. Uh, they think that all we're gonna do is learn like states and capitals but really geography can be anything. And that's something that I really like to instill in my students. Uh, maps are the same way. Um, really maps are just communication tools. And every single one of you, even if you haven't made a map in ArcGIS Online before, has made some sort of map. You probably did it today uh, because we make mental maps all the time, right? So unless you are in your bed and that is the only place you've been today, you have mapped something, right? Um, I got out of bed, drove my dog to daycare so he would not bark through this entire experience, um, drove to Starbucks and drove home, right? And I didn't use GPS for that. I didn't use a paper map. I used what was in my brain uh, because that's how we see the world and navigate around it. Um, so the main goal of any map is to communicate the data that you're trying to share and further engage with ideas. And pedagogically, this has a lot of benefits um, but mostly it's visualizing data and telling that data story. Um, I am not the GIS professor. I am a cultural and historical geographer, um, but I focus on people's memory and their identity and the story they have to tell. And mapping is really, really great for that uh, because it allows us to visualize these stories and other course concepts, right? So like this map over here, which full disclosure, I did not make in ArcGIS Online, uh, shows the story of my roommate's cat. He found him in Ancash, Peru, flew with him on a United Airline plane for a few hours uh, to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and now he has lived with us for three years. Well, him, not me anymore, but essentially we're going to talk about how we can communicate the data we have and the data our students are going to collect today, um, and it's really fun. Like, honestly, that's why I like to do it. <laughs> So lots of people, when they think of mapping, think of something like this, right? Um, this is a tornado track map that I had to make for my dissertation, uh, shows a lot of scientific data. Um, I, you know, it was taken from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Service, NOAA, all sorts of different things. Um, but a lot of our maps really look like this, right? There's a hole in it. Um, I made this in 10 seconds, right? And it just shows exactly where I need to go because what we're trying to do here is communicate these kind of spatial patterns and communicate how our story moves through the narrative that we create. Marble. 
So now to the good stuff. Um, I use story maps in my classes pretty frequently, um, all the way from introductory uh, courses through my upper divisions. Um, and here are some examples of the types of maps we can use to tell our stories with ArcGIS story maps. Uh, you have links to all of these. I'm just going to show you one of each. Um, so this is Carl's. He did this for urban geography, and he used an ArcGIS online map. I should have preloaded this instead of pressing the button. Um, and essentially what he did was a commodity biography on the Yankee Candle Company. Uh, the fun thing about story maps is not only do you get this you know, nice, crisp visualization of a map made with web, web data. You don't need programming for this, right? Um, full disclosure, my programming skills, not great, <laughs> but I really like to use ArcGIS Online and ArcMaps, and I do it for my research and my teaching, right? Um, so with his, he chose to use ArcGIS Online in a way that would take him not only through the story, but allow him to be a little bit creative too. The check it is my favorite part for the Czech Republic. I don't know why, it just makes me so happy. RTS Online also has an express, or excuse me, Story Maps also have an express map option, uh, which is something you'll learn today. Essentially, it is a mode within the Story Map that you can add with your photos and videos and then just keep on going. Um, Madison used one of those to talk about Nutella. So you see she has all her information, all her visuals, and then the map is incorporated right into her story. So what we're doing today is not so much about technical mapping in GIS, right? It's about crafting this narrative and making sure that we can see where the story is going. and Sometimes that doesn't even include maps, right? Um, these two uh, from Kate. Oh, there are three. I'll show you Kate. So um, in urban geography, it's usually a field-based course. And of course, uh, in the spring semester, that became impossible very quickly. So I had them play a game where they created uh, their own cities. And so Kate maps their way through their city and its inception through its building, right? Without actually making a map in ArcGIS Online or through the express map function. So those of you who do literature, humanities, um, and are talking about works of fiction or places that might be imagined or created, right? Uh, story maps can still work for you in that capacity. Um, they can also work in terms of the natural sciences, crafting a um, kind of linear narrative as to how different things work, right? So now that I've talked for a really long time, uh, we're going to take a little time away from me talking, right? And uh, think about how digital maps can be incorporated into your classroom and your research project. So, uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, our data, right? Uh, so the big questions we want to start asking in terms of crafting these maps is what do we want them to represent, right? Um, so what are we trying to say? What are our assignments going to be? Right? We've gotten a lot of great ideas. And then beyond that, what data will we or our students need to accomplish that? Right? And that data can come from all sorts of different places. Um, I might be getting ahead of myself here, but really anything can be data. Um, one of my friends who you're going to see um, some of her ideas about data management here in a minute, uh, wrote a great blog post on how a plant can be data if we want it to be. Um, so what you're looking at here, right, is a fictional um, map. This is of Stony Brook, Connecticut. If you know, you know, it's Babysitter's Club. Uh, and if I wanted my students to map out something like this, I have to think about what tools and techniques are available for collecting and organizing that data, right? 
one of the hardest things about data, uh, especially in the humanities and social sciences, which I feel like I kind of straddle both a lot of the time, is saying, how do I translate this qualitative data into a way that you know, people can understand and translate and isn't like a big theoretical bomb <laughs> like my cat is causing behind me. <laughs> and in terms of that, right, we have to think about how we collect, conceptualize and organize our data. Um, and like I said, uh, these are lessons taken from my friend, Hannah. Uh, she is a, um, uh, she's a data management consultant at Carnegie Mellon. Full disclosure, she's also my former roommate. Uh, we lived together during our master's program. And I, as you can tell by hearing the sounds behind me, am not the most organized person. You don't have to be type A for this. You don't have to always um, be ready and have your metadata together. It helps if you do, you're kinder to yourself if you don't just label your maps and photos and uh, data points is like data point one, two, three, four, five. It makes your life easier later if you don't. But in terms of this, we have to remember that anything can be data. Um, the blog post I linked to right here, don't worry, I made like a whole resources list that we'll send out and you can check it if you want to and this is on there. Talks about how the movie, uh, What We Can Do in the Shadows teaches us about data management. Right? So data can really be anything we want it to be. Um, but we have to understand its capabilities and its limits, right? So my data um, for my main work is tornado stories. It's stories that survivors uh, relayed to me via the phone or in person, uh, back when we could meet elderly people in person. Um, I recorded them and then I talked about those in a theoretical way in terms of memory and identity and how those kind of weather experiences matter, right? I can't do a statistical analysis on that. That's a limit, right? But that data is rich and has all sorts of capabilities in a way to tell a story and you can map it too. I'm doing that right now, actually. Um, but when we understand what our data is and what it can be, that's when we can figure out what tech we have available, right? A lot of us use a lot of different technical tools um, in Vivo. I use Canva super often. Somebody gave me a pro subscription. <laughs> and um, as Ben and Eugene know about me, if you give me an inch, I take a mile. So like I use, you give me any sort of design software or um, qualitative analysis tool and I use it forever. Um, but knowing what tech you have available and how to make it work for you is really important. Um, I would say number four is probably the most important too, right? Is to be compassionate with yourself and instill that in your students to be compassionate with themselves, right, about this data analysis and about figuring out what they can do with their data and how they can show it. Um, because sometimes we all know this, we've all, what I try to instill in my student researchers is the most important part of research is being flexible because sometimes it's not going to do what you want to do. <laughs> um, so if you don't get it right the first time or the 50th, that's okay. It's about moving forward. Um, it's about learning maybe next time. This time I was so proud of myself with all the maps I made for this, I actually labeled them and gave them metadata. It doesn't have like for my website, if you ever go to my website, all the graphics are individual graphics, but they all have the same name. So like if, if I wanna look for it, I'm, there's no way because I, didn't, I wasn't compassionate with myself at the start. So I have to be compassionate with myself someday when I rename them all. <laughs> And last but not least, don't be afraid to ask for help. I think, um, especially with our students, a lot of them um, feel like they should be able to do this, right? It's just telling a story. Um, but as we all know, telling a story is hard. Figuring out uh, what we wanna highlight, how to say that concisely and in the way we want to, to empower the story, right? And give it agency takes a lot of work. Uh, and so 
you know, even at this level, I ask for help all the time. How do you think I got these? I'm terrible at data management. So I have to call my friend Hannah all the time and say, hey, how do I, how do I do my references in like a clean and concise way where I'm not looking for this 18 year old article that I no longer have access to, right? So don't be afraid to ask for help. Sorry, I hate reading off PowerPoint slides, but I find these very important and that's the only reason I do it. So don't, it won't happen again. Okay. Um, so now I think we're ready for our um, data exercise, right? Yeah. Am I going fast? No, no, this is great. Do we wanna, maybe we'll, let's set it up a little bit. We'll talk, um, I, so what, as Ashley said at the beginning, you know, this workshop here isn't, isn't a, a GIS workshop, you know, we're not going too far into the depths of, uh, uh, you know, uh, making huge maps, uh, but we want to walk through the process of, uh, you know, thinking about data and um, using a, a, a very basic data set uh, or, or to create a data set um, to, to create a map so that later when we are working in the story maps platform that we have options to either uh, you know, borrow maps that have already been created or to use the maps that, that you've created um, and perhaps maps that your students might create like in, in the future. So we just kind of want to go through that exercise a little bit. So we will, we're going to break out here uh, for about 10 minutes. Uh, I've put everybody into a breakout room. I, uh, there are a few folks that didn't join. So um, I'm, I'm going to, to just kind of dip into the various breakout rooms. Um, but there will be, uh, you'll be in groups of, of five, and that includes the, the, the facilitator of the breakout. Um, and we can tackle this in different ways. So we, you know, we've sent out a, a couple different uh, sample data sets that are just basically Excel files um, that are in the CSV format, uh, comma separated values, which is just one very common format, if you're not familiar, one very common format that uh, is a structured format that a system like ArcGIS will understand. Um, the other options are if you do have data that you've assembled yourself and have brought it with you, uh, you're welcome to kind of play with that a little bit and work through this breakout about how, like, how might that translate into some kind of map when we get there. Um, or you can just create a very simple spreadsheet uh, that could just be, you know, it has to have some location information in it, but it could just be your five closest friends or five family members, literally a column for name, a column for city um, and a column for like relationship or something, and that can be mapped. So it's just kind of important to go through this, this quick exercise to have some data that we will use in the next breakout to populate a map. So um, does anyone have uh, questions about that? We'll have time here. This will be very unstructured. You know, we'll be working together in these breakouts to do that. But does anyone have questions about that in general? I had a question just, um, I've used some other mapping programs where you need really specific geolocation data, like the latitude, longitude coordinates put in the right order and blah, 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 right? This sounds like you could just put in Cleveland or Columbus and it would show up. Is that in fact true with story maps like ArcGIS? Like you don't need the latitude, longitude, location, geo-referenced, whatever. <laughs> that is in fact true. Oh, that's um, so much easier, oh my God. <laughs> there are some things we found. Um, it, I'll be honest, I don't use CSV data that much. And when I do, um, it's weather data. So it's like 9,000 points or something terrible. Um, we have found that some things you have to do with specificity, right? Um, so uh, one of my colleagues, and you'll see it in the thing, sent us Ohio COVID data by county. Um, but it, if you say like Franklin County, it will map every Franklin County in the United States. Uh, so you have to put like Franklin County, Ohio. Uh, but yeah, as long as you do it with some sort of specificity, like um, what I'm going to do in mine is I'm going to make one with everybody and it's, I'm going to say where my friends are. So like Edmond, Oklahoma, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you when we go through like how to pick it out to make it work for you too. So we're just going to, I'm going to briefly go over what ARC Online is. I know some of you guys uh, went ahead and played with it in your breakout rooms. So it's just um, a cloud-based software. Um, there are two different versions of it. Um, most of you are probably using the public version today, um, which you see gives like measurements, things like that. Um, also point-based data, and you can uh, put up to 250 features of your own files in. 
um, organizational, organizational um, accounts give you a lot more bells and whistles in terms of statistical analysis, um, lets you put in larger files. Um, ARC Online, if we have time, I don't know if we will, I'll show you that they also host um, their own data. So if you don't have yours, you can take theirs, which is how I made that tornado track map. I certainly don't have all that. So when you start and log in, you get to this screen and you just hit map. <coughs> We're excited. And this is your home screen. This is, you know, ground zero, as it were, for the public account. Again, if you are signed into your organization, you'll see a lot more stuff up here. But in my experience with the students, um, unless they're doing an independent study where they have a lot of statistical analysis or a lot of data, they're probably not going to go through more than 250 points. They're probably not going to need uh, much more than measurements. So the public account is generally fine for them. Um, I've honestly never had somebody be like, this is not enough. Um, so we're going to go ahead. Oh, I forgot to save my spreadsheet as a CSV. You see, sometimes. So I made a little spreadsheet during our time um, with some of my good friends, where they live, and how I know them. So I'm going to um, download that as a CSV file. I'm going to go back to my map, maybe, and then add layer from file, as I know many of y'all were doing. Remember, I am from the South. See, I wasn't kind to myself in renaming that. So now I have to go and find my untitled spreadsheet in recents. See how many screen recordings I've made in the past two semesters. I'll just say so that that screen we can't see that, and that's fine. It's like we can see Chrome, but we can't see your Finder, like your your desktop explorer window. It's. It's for the best. Yeah. After me telling you all about um, after me telling you guys about um, data organization, the fact that I just like threw this down. All right, so I have my untitled spreadsheet. I hope that's right. Not, we'll see what it is. Um, I hit import the layer. That one's not the right one. Everybody gets errors sometimes. It's totally okay. Sorry about this. Y'all are like, it's okay. The break's taking longer. It's great. Um, okay. So when you get to this, you have the locate features kind of area, right? Um, you can do it by coordinates if you have them. I didn't use those. Um, I used addresses or places. All of the friends I put in here uh, live in the United States. So that's what I'm going to choose. But you can choose any country. Um, and if you use some of the spreadsheets that we provided, like the papaya one, right? you're going to want to change that to world or else it won't work. Uh, it's very particular that way. So you're going to go to your location fields. It already knows that town is city, right? 
but whatever you have that are location fields, I know some people were asking if there were more than one. So if origin was a location field, I could go and say, you know, address or place, pick any of these options. Unfortunately, region isn't on there, but New England might be a place, we'll see. So you just add layer. One address in the file could not be located because it doesn't know where Oklahoma State is. And then you get your dots. I can't read that point data very well on my base map. So I'm going to go up here and change it. You have all of these options. And you can also add your own. It's a layer from the web or from a file. Um, you can also, I'll show you in a minute when we get to uh, showing the details, um, make your layer, if it's a larger layer or a base map layer, into uh, the base map. So you can do a few things. You can choose an attribute to show. Um, I want to show origin because I know people from different places, right? Select a drawing style. This is just your symbols, right? So all of these people are from Oklahoma State. I'm going to change the symbol on that because they're orange and black. They're not red. And you can pick a shape if you would like to. I'm going to use an image. So you can use an image URL. I'll go over here. I'll type in Oklahoma State. Pick an image I like. Um, this is from Wikipedia, so I know it's on Wiki Commons. Copy the link address. Oh, that's my spreadsheet. It's a different spreadsheet than the one that opened, but it doesn't matter. Add that link address in there. And it wasn't a PNG, so it didn't work. So we're going to just pick a shape instead. My friends are stars, so we're going to make it bigger, 18. And then all of the people who I know from OSU would show up as an orange star, right? And so had I um, opened the spreadsheet that I wanted to, uh, we would have had some people I knew from Wyoming, all of that, and we could change it there. Um, this can also work, right? Um, if you want to choose a different attribute. So if I wanted to um, make a different symbol or um, color for each person, um, like many of you who are talking about mapping characters and character names, you can do that too, right? So if um, you're mapping, like, I don't know why I'm on the Babysitter's Club, but that's where I'm at. If you want to map like where Dawn uh, Claudia and Stacy babysat in this one book. You could do that, pick name, and just make all of you know Claudia as a paintbrush, all of Stacy's a calculator because she was a treasurer, and all of Dawn's like a plant or something, right? Um, you can also um, show uh, different location data, right? Again, changing the symbols. Um, changing the tra transparency of those symbols. I love messing with transparency. It's like my favorite thing to do. Uh, and then also changing the visible range um, all the way from the world to whatever room they're in. There's a large scale. Um, but I'm gonna focus on these because that's one I like the most. So you just hit done. If you don't, it won't save. Uh, and then you have your content. Within your contents, you can look at a bunch of different things. So you can show the legend. Mine's not very exciting. You can show your table to see who lives where, right? Or what, you know, what data belongs to what point. And yeah, that just shows your legend in a different way. On this details tab, you can also set your visibility range, change your transparency. Um, and depending on what kind of layer it is, uh, this is where you could make it like the base map or not. 
if you have lots of different layers, like if I wanted to slap the papaya thing over this, or um, if I wanted to use the living atlas, right? Uh, this is all ARC Online data, so it's free to use for you. Um, if I wanted to put food, so I also study uh, urban sustainability and food justice. If I wanted to look at where my friends could go to the supermarket in 2017, you can add that. You can use it as a base map as well. The colors are not going to look good with my orange stars. I'm just telling you right now it's fine. Right? And then that's incorporated. And I can, um, it's going to make me do it over here. I can pick it up and I can change usually. I don't know why it's not letting me pick it up. Probably because this only has three points on it. And it's like, what do you want me to do? Um, but generally, you can change the order of these things as well. So if I wanted to add supermarket access and also like food production of some sort, So here, this one's also 2017. Oh, that's Canada though. Okay, so if I want to see where their supermarkets are and also what their most common livestock is, I could put that underneath. And just stack it the way I see fit. I still want to see my stars, but I want to see where they live within livestock now. If I decide that this is information that does not matter to me or I don't want on this map, you can just remove it and it's like it never happened. Um, and then when you're ready to do something else with it, you'll save it. It makes you enter a title and tags. So where my friends go to the supermarket, and then you can add a description if you'd like to, and it'll save it in your content folder, which will become important when we start to story map. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, that was great. I think we, we just had one. I think Megan was was just asking. So like the different layers can have just very different data points, right? And you just add layers to. Absolutely. I can't, I can't promise they'll look good, but you can add a lot of layers um, and kind of play around with it. Um, so when I was kind of going over what I wanted to do the other day, um, I did cotton production here. I can just, I can just show y'all what that map looks like. Well, no, I'll add it on the story map. I won't get ahead of myself. Um, but I wanted to make sure like the images would add to my map notes, which is um, if you want to make like a note or a description on any sort of point you want. Uh, so I put uh, my parents' house, which I know I grew up down the street from a cotton field. So I knew it was going to be like big in the green. And I put a picture of downtown Altus, Oklahoma in it. And so it's like this awkward picture of downtown in the cotton fields. Doesn't look awesome, but you can put wildly different data anywhere you want. All right. Last but not least, sort of the star of the show, right? Um, it's story mapping, yay. Um, it has a lot of the same benefits as ARC Online because it's tied to ARC Online um, as well as the rest of the Esri suite, right? So it connects to your current accounts, um, which I'll kind of show you what that looks like in a minute if it's the first time you've used it. Um, it also has its own express map option. Uh, the reason I like this so much um, and if you looked at any of my sample assignments, you already know this about me, is it's super customizable. You can use these for a million different things and students can make them look however they want. And 
my favorite thing is to tell them to be creative, which they hate. They want exact. <laughs> uh, often, especially my uh, lower division students are like, I need you to tell me exactly what you want. And I'm like, I want you to tell me a story. That's what I want you to do. Um, and with story maps, you can really do it any way you want. Um, there are, for me, three really important uh, aspects of story mapping. That's leading with visuals. We're doing this because it's a good visual product, right? Um, I have students putting these in their portfolios. I have students using um, them for other uh, things. Like I have um, one student who's, he's a computer science major and he's done all of these like big, exciting data sets. He made an app for my independent study class. Like I don't understand 99% of what he does, uh, but his uh, online portfolio is a story map um, because he can embed all of those things uh, very easily. And you have embedding um, from other websites once you join the organization. The next is to write clearly and concisely. We have all read, um, published papers, sometimes student papers, right? Um, where they used every word the thesaurus gave them. And it was, it sounded beautiful, I'm sure, uh, but it's tough to read. So we want these to be clear and concise because you're trying to set up a narrative. It might be linear, it might be based on characters or organisms, but it is at the end of the day, a story. So for people to understand and engage with this is very, very important. And last but not least, uh, the one thing that I tell everybody, oh, yeah, that's the end, uh, is if it doesn't work, clear your cookies. I know it sounds stupid to tell you to like go in and clear um, that, you know, held onto internet data, but for a lot of tools and a lot of life, right, clearing some space makes it work. Uh, most of the time when students are like, the story map isn't working, I don't know what to do, none of it is working, uh, they clear their cookies and it works again. And when I say most of the time, like 99 times out of 100. All right, so I'll get off of this because you just want to see the story map. Uh, oops, there Chrome went, okay. So when you get to storymaps.rts.com, you have this option, right? Where you can start a new story if you would like. You can also start a story from your ARC Online map. So you can do this one of two ways. If you make a map in ARC Online, it's going to be the, and you want it to be the real anchor for your story, right? If I want to make a story map about uh, Jen, Jenny, and Allie, then I can hit share right up here. Uh, if you want to embed it in a different website, you have to make it public. Students hate that, but it's the truth. Um, and you can just hit create a web app, build a story map. And then um, these are all different types of story maps. These are like um, these after the basic that you see um, are what they call classic story maps that used to be the standard uh, story map basic, which is uh, the new and improved story map I find to be much easier to use. Um, so. You can create a new web app from there, hit select, create web app. Sorry, I put you guys down and I can't hit done, done. <laughs> and then it will add that store that um, map for you once it's done loading uh, and begin a story map for you based off of that map. In theory. Um, and you can play with themes and colors and all sorts of things that resource page that I made has a ton of like style links to and hex codes. Um, but this starts the story map for you if you want to do it through ARC Online. If like many of us, we have lots of different maps we've made, 
we'll want to start from the launch point. Okay. So we just hit new story. There are lots of quick starts, but we're going to start from scratch because we're just being wild today, right? It launches your story builder. And then you can title your story and start telling it. So once you click this button, this little add button, uh, if you had a Zanga or a Tumblr or a MySpace long back in the day, you can make a story map because you it's literally a plus sign and then add in what you want. We're going to add in a map because, well, frankly, that's what we're doing today. And we can do it in one of two ways. This My Maps right here is every map you've made on your pro profile on Arc Online. Okay. So you can add it from here and show you where my friends go to shop. You can mess with the appearance again if you would like. You can re edit it in Arc Online if you would like. Um, in terms of the features, most important thing if you do this is to go to the settings option and you can allow for navigation or not. You can set it and it's a static map and people can't mess with what you've chosen. You can add a search bar. You can show where somebody's current location is if that's set up. And you can add your legend to the bottom of the map like this so they can just press the little button and it tells you what you're doing. Then you just hit place map. and it adds it to your map for you. And you can customize what it looks like up here um, if you want it to float. So you have text on the side, right? You can also make it bigger or smaller uh, and whoever is looking at it can expand and then interact with it in a way that they see fit. Uh, you can also add. I know you guys are excited to get started, so I'm not trying to take up too much of your time. You can also, when you add your next node, I want to add an express map. Express maps have less functionality um, in many ways than Arc Online, but if you just have point data um, or if you're trying to kind of um, trace somebody, uh, these are great options because you still have your points that you can add, numbered or otherwise. You can add lines. You can draw them freehand, which I never do because, well, you saw the map I drew earlier in this <laughs> um, earlier in this activity. Uh, and you can also add an area. Um, I know we have a biologist. One of my uh, zoology students uh, used this function to. Um, map all of the areas where naked mole rats were found in a story map she made on mesotherms. And it was just really, really great. And again, you can do that through a polygon um, or you can freehand it or just a circle or a rectangle. You can also add text annotations. Um, and in this annotation kind of plane, you can add images and you can do arrows as well. These are kind of, you know, messier in a way because you can just search by location, right? So if I want to talk about where I'm from, I can just go to Altus, Oklahoma. I could also type my parents' address in there if I wanted to, and it goes straight to their address. Um, I have done it for, uh, for my dissertation. They wanted to know uh, if a tornado had ever been close to me. And then when you get to this point, not only can you change the style to a symbol or a photo of your choosing, you can add um, sizing, sorry, I have to click on it again. You can add a description and you can add an image. So if I don't wanna do any of that, I'm just gonna pick a symbol. I'm gonna pick a color that I like. You also have um, a hex code finder. I'll make it lime green for no apparent reason, or I guess that's kind of a Kelly green. Hit done. And then again, those settings allow for map navigation. I don't want to, I just wanna zoom right in to Altus, Oklahoma, like, look at it, yay. 
select my base map. This time we're going to go like a light blue. Just reach so you can see. And then there's not a really a legend to be needed, but we hit done. And that goes into your story map as well. So those are the two ways you can really incorporate um, maps that are interactive if you want them to be into your story. Um, if you have organizational capabilities, you can also embed maps because somebody asked about um, like Google Maps, you can embed Google Maps through there, but only if you have the organizational or a personal subscription. Um, swipe maps or images are also like my favorite thing that I want to give you guys the time to play with this because that's what this is for, right? Uh, that's where you can compare two maps and go back and forth with a little slider. All right, so um, that, that that concludes the last of our breakouts. I know I'm sure you've all had time, as I said, to master story maps uh, in those uh, eight minutes. Um, hopefully, though, uh, it gave you at least a taste and a, and a interest in pursuing that on your own. Um, Ashley, do you want to uh, offer any final remarks? Or um, I know we're we're a little bit past our noon time. Uh, just want to want to be respectful of everyone's time. But if you have any final remarks. Um, all I want to say is remember, there are no bad maps, right? It's just no matter what it looks like, you can clean it, no matter how many times you have to refresh or change things around. It's going to work out fine because it's you communicating your story and there's nothing bad about that, right? <laughs> and if you have any questions and need to troubleshoot, um, the resource page has my contact information and I am more than willing to answer any questions anybody might have.